Namaste, friends, and welcome to our Saturday edition of Economic Words of Wisdom, Arth Gyan Ganga, which we beam across the globe on our four social media channels of YouTube, Instagram, uh, Periscope, that is Twitter Periscope, and Facebook. And we are happy to have you once more in our program on today's lecture by Dr. Subramaniam Swami on profit maximization. As you all know, we started on the 2nd of April, this series in on 2020 during the pandemic. First two months, we had a daily program. And then afterwards, we switched to our Sunday regular program. And we have completed today, the, the, we have completed already 103 episodes. And today is the 104th episode. And we have done, uh, sorry, uh, uh, we have completed the Sunday 103 episodes and today in the economic series, it is our sixth episode and we have also done the Saturday program of legal words of wisdom that is uh, Nyai Gyan Ganga on 21 episodes we have completed. So today is the 130th episode of our uh, spreading of knowledge, empowering and educate the uh, our people all over the globe. So we have with us Dr. Subramaniam Swami and Professor Arvind Chaturvedi. And I have with me our co-host Ramesh Swami. And I also thank our technical team led by Ashish Shetty, Vishal Mehta, Ishwar Iyer, Tejas, uh, Swami Nathan and Rakesh Gargi for their support to put this program together. We have nearly 1,21,000 subscribers on our Virat Hindustan Sangam uh, YouTube channel alone. And this is, as I mentioned, watched across the globe. So we thank you for your cooperation and support. I would request viewers, if you want to know more about Virat Hindustan Sangam and the movement Dr. Swami has launched, please visit our website, www.vhs, V for v, Virat, H for Hindustan, S for Sangam, that is VHS india.org and please become members and support our movement. So with this opening remarks on the lecture of profit maximization, it is over to Dr. Swami and thereafter we'll have a discussion led by Arvind Chaturvedi and Ramesh Swami. So over to Dr. Swami for this lecture. Thank you and Dhaniyavad. <coughs> Thank you Jagdish. <coughs> now, this uh, purpose of this uh, lecture series is not to make you an economist because that's a very big subject and it has so many dimensions uh, microeconomics, macroeconomics, economic policy, uh, then uh, international trade, uh, financial. You know, there, there are so many areas uh, and I will not be able to, um, you know, do this because these are done over three, four years of courses uh, in a university. And uh, I'm also assuming that my class uh, is not, uh, that the, the people who are here, the lecture, are people who are learning, uh, just trying to learn the basic uh, economic literacy aspect, so that you don't make bloomers like doubling of uh, GDP in uh, five years to five trillion. Uh, you will immediately know, no, that can't be done because the growth rate required to be 14.8% per year. Uh, so those are the kinds of things I want to equip you so that in your, uh, even if you are not an economist, you would know when somebody is guessing about uh, economics or, you know, misleading you about economics. <clears throat> so we uh, basically took uh, first this microeconomics. Essentially microeconomics, uh, although it's not uh, completely that, essentially microeconomics is uh, of what a person would do in a certain circumstance. How would he make the decision? And what are the things that will go into the decision making? And then we, when you come to macroeconomics, you are dealing with the whole economy. And I told you that what is true in microeconomics is not necessarily true in macroeconomics. I gave you the example of, uh, of you know, uh, if uh, supposing I cut wages, that makes labor cheaper. But that doesn't mean that uh, employment will increase because by cutting wages, uh, as I, exp I explained to you, the purchasing power goes down, so the demand goes down, uh, factories start closing down, 
and then there's more unemployment. And so the, these are these uh, when you go to macroeconomics, many of the things you learn in microeconomics are not true unless you uh, take more dimensions into account. So first I want to therefore get this basic one dimensional uh, person's uh, uh, that is one person's uh, economic decision making and tell you how decisions are made and then we will go on to the uh, broader picture. So when we began uh, we, decided, we said that uh, normally for a consumer uh, there is a, uh, he has a budget constraint uh, you may call it income or you can call it money uh, in his pocket uh, but uh, you know the if, uh, within that constraint he has to buy a number of commodities. Now the problem of teaching that is that in uh, in real life you can have only <clears throat> you can have only um, two dimensional things and uh, strictly speaking <clears throat> you can have one commodity and one price and uh, with a little abstraction uh, as uh, Arvind Chaturvedi showed you last time uh, in difference curves you can have two commodities uh, but then the complexity of interpreting that becomes uh, tougher and tougher. So <clears throat> we start where we started with the consumer economics by saying a person wants to maximize his satisfaction. His satisfaction subject to the budgetary constraint. So um, uh, how, how do you measure satisfaction? Still though we do not know in economics how to measure satisfaction. There is no empirical way I can measure the satisfaction. We say yes a notional idea of a, a utility function which will include the consumption uh, of uh, what you buy and of course a budget constraint and then there is a calculus of it, it is called the Lagrangian multiplier method of finding the maximum value for your satisfaction within the budget constraint. So that is what we did last time. and. Uh, and out of that I, uh, I will uh, tell you how we can derive if you knew calculus enough. I mean gra graphically it is a much tougher job but it can be done but they are only done for two variables. But we can derive the demand curve of the individual. What we started with is maximization of his satisfaction with a budget constraint which is price times the amount you bought. Uh, that is a, that must be less than the amount of money you have which may, you may call as I or M as you like. From there to go saying for every price what would be his demand, how much would he like to buy that uh, is to be derived from this. So that uh, we, we, uh, uh, we will in the course of our lectures as I feel that you are uh, you know I feel confident that you have now absorbed the basic concepts. I will bring it in. <clears throat> so today uh, I would like to depart from this consumer thing into uh, what I call is the, uh, um, the theory of uh, um, uh, profit maximization. But I will say that in the end when a person has a demand, his demand is dependent on the price. But it is also dependent on the money he has. So if uh, the price falls, it is not necessary he will buy more. He may say okay this is bajra, I was eating bajra, now let me buy some uh, uh, you know uh, this um, high quality rice called basumati, uh, let me try and buy a little bit of that or let me buy some more vegetables, previously I was only buying rice and uh, putting a little uh, dal in it and uh, you know my, that was my dinner. But now I have got uh, the price of dal is, uh, price of rice has fallen down. So I have some surplus money. So I might buy curd, I might buy, buy something else. So therefore it does not mean that just because prices of rice has fallen I will buy more, more rice. So that, those are things which will come in as we get more and more complex mathematics uh, uh, employed. So the two effects which a consumer faces is one is 
the price effect. If the price goes up, uh, he uh, naturally needs more money for the same amount. So demand may come down or he may uh, buy a smaller amount and with the money saved he could buy uh, something which is uh, more luxurious an item. So those are things which is called substitution effect, they are called income effect, you know all, all these uh, complicated complex uh, concepts are there. Let me see as we go along whether I can reintroduce it but at this moment please understand that a consumer has a notion of what is satisfaction which he quantifies which is called a utility function which has never never been estimated econometrically that is they haven't uh, interviewed people and then asked them and then draw a graph and get an utility function because it's a subjective idea how much satisfaction you get it varies from individual to individual and the best thing that uh, anything can be said is uh, something is more preferred and something is less preferred and uh, and, they, and that this is what they in mathematics is called the ordinal comparisons not cardinal comparisons cardinal is absolute value but ordinal is ranking it's a it's a question of ranking so in that situation uh, i uh, uh, would like to say that when there was in the 1930s a lot of criticism now what kind of economics is this, they have got all these imaginary concepts of satisfaction, they are not able to admit, it is not like science, it is not physics, it is not chemistry where you can get numbers and then you can get equations and so on. So the economists used to feel terribly inferior and then slowly mathematics started coming, it began to get some respect, then came this bright student uh, after a bachelor's degree in, uh, in uh, Chicago and he came to do his PhD at Harvard called Paul Samuelson and he then decided uh, that can I find some way using market data to draw up the same conclusions which I got by assuming utility function. So I bypassed the concept of utility function and market data can always be got by sample surveys. So if um, our friend um, uh, Ramesh will now put on the um, uh, point 0.5 for which I have uh, 0.5 not this is a uh, point this is a point 0.5. So before I go further to the profit maximization I introduce what is even today a revolutionary concept. Uh, Paul Samuelson's revealed preference theory which was part of his 1939 the year I was born PhD thesis at Harvard. And he said, let us assume there is a consumer who buys x to the, not power, uh, by notation uh, x0, it is a vector that is x10, x20, x30 depending on the number of commodities and that is a vector and that x0 uh, and each of those uh, commodities have a price. So we have another vector uh, called p to the power 0. So at, uh, at a time 0, uh, the amount you bought in the market was x and uh, the price prevailing was p. There will be number of p's but uh, the vector is called p. So at 0, x0 at p0. Then, uh, but he did not buy x1, another commodity bundle at the price prevailing then of p0. So therefore what shall I assume? I shall assume that if multiplying p0 by x0, two vectors, I will get the total expenditure on buying x0 and I say if that was larger than the amount I would be spending would be larger than the amount I would have spent if I bought something else, x1. So if that amount was larger and yet in the second situation he buys x1 at p1, now the price has changed to p1 as the second. So if he buys x1 at p1, it must mean p1 x1, the amount spent buying uh, x1 in the situation, uh, situation, the second situation must be less than p1 x0 
otherwise you would have bought again you would have bought x0 why did not he buy x0 or you must have got, he bought x1 instead of x0 because uh, the amount of money that was required for buying x0 at p1 places must be greater than p1 x1 so he could not afford it. So this is the if the uh, if the if, his, if the consumer is logical and he chose x0 in time 0 p uh, and the price then was p0 and he did not buy x1 but he bought it in the second situation he did not buy it in the first one the reason he did not buy it in the first one is because uh, it was uh, insufficient for the money he had and therefore the amount he spent was px p0 x0 that must be larger than what he would have spent x1 and he had that money if he bought uh, x1 at price p0 he would have saved that money but we do not have we have our postulate is not that he would save money he is not going to try to save money he's taken that money to the market and he's going to spend all of it buying so if that is so p0 x0 is greater than or equal to p0 x1 then and if he in the second situation he doesn't buy x0 but he buys x1 at price p1 then the amount you would have spent buying x1 at price p1 must be less than the price uh, 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 the, the amount that would be necessary to buy x0 at price p1. Now if you this is not very easy to understand because uh, uh, of course uh, when I, by the time I came to uh, Harvard and uh, took cross registered in a course in MIT with Paul Samuelson I had already studied all this on my own because I was uh, you know top of my class in bachelors in mathematics and uh, and mathematics was a, you know was a craze with me and I had even though I had a lot of problems in the ISI with the chairman Mr. Mahalon Abyss whose life uh, whose reputation I wrecked by writing a paper showing that his paper claiming to be great originality was all bogus uh, but in my spare time I kept reading Samuelson and it took me a little time to understand that these two uh, inequalities are the foundations of the uh, whole consumer uh, consumer behavior theory we do not need a utility function you can get all the results you want including demand curves and uh, income effect everything just knowing these two things and I will not be able to uh, explain this just now because it will take me very far afield uh, into explaining so many things but I want to say that why Paul Samuelson became an instant genius was as his PhD thesis he said you do not need utility function these two equations will give you everything that the utility function uh, gives you. So I will get back a little later about what further I can derive from utility uh, functions uh, using utility functions and then show that the, how easy it is to get it from this reveal preference. Why is it called reveal preference? Because the first time you bought x0 that was your revealed preference. You revealed it, I am buying x0 uh, at the current prevailing price and uh, in the second time I am buying x1. So I am revealing my preference that in the, the budget constraint I, I have I can only afford uh, x1 so therefore uh, these two equations will get you everything which I will show you. If you really want uh, to you are a hot shot in mathematics and you want to know a little more about this you can uh, read um, uh, any of the textbooks that have come out on uh, mathematical economics. Uh, unfortunately in his own PhD thesis um, which is published by the Harvard University Press uh, called Foundations of Economic Analysis. Uh, that book although it has been a text in our courses in uh, advanced courses for PhD students in uh, Harvard and MIT even today uh, it uh, digesting is not that easy. So uh, having said that now I will move to production theory. Now production theory is uh, much more simple I mean uh, what we call is 
um, uh, how how much to produce. Is this the uh, well, this is the book Foundation of Economic? This analysis. is the book Foundations and Economic Analysis produced by Harvard University Press. Okay. And uh, and then uh, it's uh, the chapter on pure theory, pure theory of consumer behavior. Uh, in that he has developed the revealed preference theory. By the way, revealed preference theory had a difficulty. I, I must say, because this is anecdote. This is not for uh, in the uh, uh, revealed preference theory. I can say x naught is preferred to x one. But I will not be able to prove that is preferred to x2. What you are saying just now is in uh, situation 0, uh, x0 is preferred to x1. And uh, because of, uh, uh, you know, which is within your budget. Second situation, x1 is preferred to x0. But supposing uh, in another situation, uh, there is an x2. Then is x1 preferred to x2 or not? If a x0 is preferred to x1, x1 is preferred to x2, a, a, will x0 be preferred to x2? That is called transitivity. Uh, so there are a lot of problems on that. And uh, then another professor who was also my uh, thesis advisor along with uh, 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 Simon Kuznets was Professor Henrik Hautaka. And he then developed the calculus for proving that if x1 is preferred to x2, x2 is preferred to x3, x4, x4 then x1 is preferred to x4 and it is called transitivity condition. And that transitivity condition he should have got the Nobel Prize, but he was too right wing for the Nobel Committee. Even uh, uh, Samuelson had to suffer at Harvard because of anti-Semitism that is anti-Jew and he would not get his uh, faculty position. So he took an oath and went to MIT, which had nothing, and uh, he built a fantastic department there. And then after that, uh, over the years, uh, Harvard realized its mistake, and then they we entered into an agreement where you could cross-register in MIT. So anyway, so uh, in, uh, moving away from that, uh, can we put now the uh, 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 item seven? Yeah. So let me look at first the simplest model. Pi is profit. Q is the production of an of a entrepreneur. And uh, P is the price. And this is only one. I am not, uh, this is not a vector. Uh, P is the price of uh, the commodity uh, which, uh, which you are wanting to buy, uh, you want to produce Q. Q amounts. So PQ is, if you P is the, what price is it? Market price for buying it. So P times Q is revenue. And minus C is the function of the production which gives you the cost of producing Q. And minus the fixed uh, uh, fixed cost that you suffer, you see. So that is A, so minus A. So that must be the profit, the simplest terms. And what we want is maximization of profit. And so what does calculus tell us? Uh, differentiate that. D pi by dq. Those who don't know calculus, just say, you know, just listen. I will then orally explain without calculus. Uh, d pi by dq is p's uh, fixed number is the price at which it will be sold q is the variable and if you de derivate uh, take a derivative of q with respect to uh, uh, with q then you will get 1 so p dot 1 uh, is just p minus dc by dq it's a derivative of the cost function and it is called the marginal cost curve why? Because for an additional production, it tells you what is the additional cost. Delta, uh, you know, after all, you know from if you know calculus, you know that delta dc is the limit of the uh, concept of an increment called delta. It is by used by another Greek uh, symbol, delta c. That is the additional cost 
or producing additional uh, amount of production and that is DQ uh, delta Q and if you take its limit uh, then you get uh, those who know calculus will understand now those who don't don't worry about it uh, so DC by DQ is the marginal cost curve for every Q it will give you a number and you can plot it so that uh, when you put that equal to 0 d, d, d pi by dq you the solution of that for q which I call as q star it is the uh, production that you will engage in when the cost curve is like that. So uh, dc by dq uh, at the q, q, q equal to q star that is you fill in I uh, will give you examples next time but the uh, thing is uh, that it is equal to p because p will go to this side so dc by dq is p. Now uh, Arvind has uh, given some uh, graphs on this uh, which uh, you know I am sure that we will put it out the, towards the end so you will know uh, but at this time I do not need it but according to calculus how do I know this is maximum because it could be minimum according to calculus also. I mean the minimum profit. So for that there is something called a second order condition which is another derivative of the d pi by dq which is called d2 q uh, pi divided by dq square evaluated at the optimum uh, amount and if that is negative then you got a maximum whatever okay. So let us proceed with that a little further. Uh, now um, uh, I have not uh, um, uh, given it in uh, for uploading because it is still in the preliminary stage. Uh, what I would say is I can now expand this because at the moment I am only being told how much to produce but I want to know how much labor how much capital also I have to in, uh, have to uh, 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 you know uh, use that is the optimum. For, uh, for maximum profit how much capital should I use how much labor I should, should use. So therefore what I will get is that Q is the amount produced that will be a function I will put all this in, uh, in uh, uh, for uploading next time because uh, we are running out of time um, and uh, my other colleagues also have something to say. Uh, so um, therefore I will finish with this. Uh, pi uh, p q q I will write as a function of capital and labor. Later on I will add one more thing innovation because the amount you will produce with the same capital and same labor if you have got an innovation it will be much more. So therefore but I do not want to get into it just now when I go to economic theory, theory of economic growth I will bring that in uh, innovation inventions how they affect you know that uh, uh, Britain was a very backward country all they got was whatever money they had got was by looting India through East India company then they used that to finance their scientists and uh, locomotive was discovered and uh, after locomotive was discovered then they also set up a Bessemer steel plant blast uh, Bessemer blast uh, Bessemer blast furnace for steel and for the first time steel came all this happened in 1815 uh, between 1815 and 1835 and thus began Britain's industrial revolution. Later on the Americans did this replicated it but they went ahead got wireless and they got uh, um, uh, you know uh, teleprinters and so on and this uh, you know um, uh, led to finally aeroplanes jet engines. Um, you know and finally at the end of the century last century internet which has completely transformed everything how you communicate post uh, how you send post and so on how you transfer documents all this has been changed by internet and in the future you will find uh, some uh, more inventions uh, desalination of sea plants uh, sea water has already come now there will be never water shortage for drinking then uh, countries like India if they use their brains instead of only uh, doing uh, Norton keys uh, you will find that we have 60 percent of the world's thorium in the sands of the Tamil Nadu and Kerala if we can convert that by to uh, uranium we will have reactors galore in our country 
we don't have to import. We, today we don't have any uh, uranium. We are importing it from abroad from the United States after that agreement we signed. But Baba, Homi Baba foresaw that at that time. So he began the research and he found there are three stages to convert uh, thorium into uranium usable, uh, reactor usable uranium. And so he crossed two stages and then he was killed in an air crash. People say that, uh, you know, he was killed um, by foreign forces like they did with this uh, ISRO matter also. But anyway, he was killed. But his junior uh, Setsuna came in and then there were many other scientists by then uh, uh, Baba had been. So we were again very close to crossing the third uh, barrier to convert. And at that time, Manmohan Singh went and signed the agreement with the Americans. And the Americans said, you stop this uh, research on, uh, on uh, thorium and we will give you all the uranium you want. So because of the Indo-US agreement on nuclear technology, we have forgotten about this. But I think we have to come back. And supposing we, uh, you know, already the world is invented, uh, still in the preliminary stage, hydrogen fuel cells, then you don't have to get any uh, oil from Arab countries. Hydrogen fuel cells will drive your cars. You know, all you have to do is plug it in the night, it will be charged in the morning, you can go to uh, 300 kilometers. And if you create, uh, instead of petrol bunkers, you create charger bunkers, then of course it will be like any other car. And many countries have started, uh, you know, hydrogen fuel cells cars. And uh, Toyota is bringing out one uh, very soon. But we uh, are not gone into this at all. We only talk about Atman Nirbhar and all these bakwas I keep telling. But we are not saying, I have set up an institution and I have given them uh, 1 lakh crores, do research and tell us how to uh, build uh, a hydrogen fuel cells uh, cars. That is the way to do it. You have to encourage people and give them fat salaries and, you know, remove, remove their normal uh, worries about managing a family and the budget. Then only they can do research. That's all how, the, how the United States did it. That's how China has done it. That's how the Russians did it in the, when it was USSR. So we should do it. I'm coming back to this. I'm saying that innovation is the most important thing. If you just rely on more capital, more labor, like we are doing today, getting money from this person, that person, so on, then law of diminishing returns will go operate. The only way to escape uh, law of diminishing returns is by innovations which will take you to a higher and higher plane. So, um, I will go next time into this question that supposing Q is a function of capital and labor, <coughs> then how much capital, how much labor uh, should be utilized? The equations will not change. Instead of Q, I will have a function here with K and L. Uh, and instead of uh, CQ, I will have wage rate W multiplied by the amount of labor used minus rate of return uh, on interest for uh, borrowing capital. So that will be R times K. And so instead of CQ, I will have W L, which is the wage bill, and RK, which is the amount you have to pay for getting the loan. So, or, or, and put that into the equation and then you use calculus, you will get very remarkable results, uh, which, uh, you know, are, will be very useful to you in business economics. So, uh, uh, today I have uh, finished what I wanted to finish to tell you how uh, uh, production is determined. In the simplest model, just write profit and maximize it. Uh, and uh, you, but you must you must know the market price, which of course everybody will know. And uh, the, you must know the cost function, which is a function of the amount you produce that uh, you can estimate. So, by, and of course the fixed uh, fixed uh, uh, amount, uh, fixed cost, which uh, is never figures in any decision making because it's fixed. And so, when you differentiate a constant, it becomes zero. So now. Uh, how to um, how to do it when you expand into a bigger area, and how does this um, uh, translate itself into uh, a growth model? Uh, these are some of the things we will be doing later. But at the moment, uh, the production theory is uh, for an individual entrepreneur 
is simply profit maximization where the key variables uh, the price is taken as given uh, sometimes you can also introduce variable prices depending on how much you produce but an individual how much can he affect the price it's only if uh, in a, you know is a monopoly he can affect the price so we have a separate analysis for monopolies that will come if it's necessary but at the moment uh, we have the basic concept that a consumer uh, he maximizes his satisfaction subject to a budget constraint and uh, <coughs> since you can't estimate uh, satisfaction uh, if you follow samuelson's uh, reveal preference theory you don't even need to you just need to know what you bought in uh, point uh, point number 0 and what you bought in point number uh, 1 and from that you can construct his demand curve which uh, maybe uh, at a later stage i'll uh, come back to and show how it can be done that is there in in all the books now modern mathematical economics books and so on you can go to google and just ask for uh, mathematical economics or introductory better still introductory mathematical economics and they will uh, you will be able to get it there so what i'll also try and put it put it in here because i want to move from microeconomics to macroeconomics because that is the way place where your literacy is going to be determined because if you are in a, a in the ministry if you are a, if you are a consultant you know where, where somebody wants you what should be our policy then you must know uh, the macroeconomics which is a large number of variables interdependent with each other and that's where in, input output also analysis comes so uh, in that way we'll move forward i am telling you my, my ideas to make you a literate in economics and not a scholar in economics because that will take me at least three years uh, because it's a, become such a sophisticated subject now and uh, i've learned it from the biggest giants in the field and so i look at know it from the like the back of my hand that's why i keep embarrassing all our governments uh, when i tell them what they're doing is wrong because it comes immediately to me but you also if you path, follow the path i am going to chalk out for you and take it forward you will also be in a position where you can give much more intelligent uh, analysis of the current situation that we have here i'll end the course of course with with uh, what's the current situation how we can get out of it how we can become a 10 percent growth rate country all this i will tell you because i've done all this work already in the past so i'll uh, just uh, uh, you know uh, uh, present it to you in simpler forms in this course so over to you uh, Naresh, uh, ramesh uh, now you conduct the proceedings further okay uh, arvind ji do you want to say anything yeah uh, i want to add uh, to what dr swami has said uh, first of all dr swami talked about the revealed the preference theory of the paul samuelson and uh, this means that individual products the utility of individual products is undefinable at least uh, uh, in a formula or in a scientific manner and this utility varies from person to person and this for same person also this utility may vary from time to time therefore this is a very complex thing so maybe in a theory this is good and therefore when uh, uh, paul samuelson came up with this that means what paul samuelson says in very common words is that market expenditure patterns can reveal what actually people are satisfied with at the given price. Only thing is prices keep on changing and therefore the preferences also keep on changing. And this is one very important thing. Now this also has implication for a producer. When Dr. Swami is talking about the producer uh, with using that uh, uh, pi as a profit function, the cost minus the uh, revenue, revenue one is a cost. Uh, in fact, uh, for a firm, it will be a different chart altogether. For industry, it will be a different chart altogether. And as Dr. Swami has already said, that in a monopoly situation, the decision making will be different. In a perfect competition, the decision making will be different. So the, some of the charts I had actually prepared, this is just to show that how long can an entrepreneur in a, at the firm level continue to produce and what level of production will maximize the profit. So it says the marginal revenue and marginal cost. As long as marginal revenue is higher than the marginal cost, what does it mean? It means that 
whatever cost is required to produce one extra unit of the product if the revenue generated from that one extra unit is higher he will continue to produce and at that stage where the marginal cost is equal to the marginal revenue that will be the point where the profit will be the maximum and therefore anything produces uh, produced thereafter the marginal revenue will be less than the cost and therefore the losses will start that means the profit total profit will start declining and therefore in order to maximize the total profit at the firm level at the uh, now only thing is these things are true in a static situation or short term situation in a long term situation like for example this chart shows this chart shows the marginal cost uh, going up at a particular point the revenue is shown here the total cost is shown in a different curve so that means when you identify the arrow going down that is the level where the profit is maximum and therefore the producer will stop stop producing anything further produced that means the cost will be more and the revenue will be uh, less say uh, 100 units uh, produced if 100 first unit is produced the cost will be more than the revenue and therefore it will not be in the interest of producer that is what this curve says different uh, 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 graphs of different situations can also be shown as dr swami said detailed analysis and detailed discussion will be done little later and one one very important thing i want to ask dr swami if we are trying to maximize this at from the pro, uh, entrepreneur's point of view and when the situation changes over a period of time that means nothing remains static everything is dynamic even the competition is dynamic competition may bring the changes in the prices the inputs are also dynamic the cost of labor may change over a period of time the cost of capital may also change that means whatever we are is actually discussing this is true in the short run when nothing changes so this short run may be for example from uh, holi to diwali uh, the preferences of people will also change not only that the prices may change the workers may go migrant laborers will go therefore the labor will become expensive so these things are all dynamic and therefore in a dynamic kind of situation we have sophisticated models including the linear programming linear or both non linear programming also those models are used to maximize the objective function and when the objective function is profit the profit can still be several constraints can be used several variables can be used this is what i have to just you. add to what dr swami said thank you ji thank you okay, jagdish ji uh, arvind ji you can conclude yeah so today we have just discussed two uh, major aspects one aspect was uh, continuing from the last episode in last episode we were talking about consumer maxima utility maximization today dr swami brought in a new thing saying that yes you, as a theory utility 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 maximization is good but all simulations thing revealed preferences will actually be uh, 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 much better in terms of uh, thinking as uh, to how to uh, uh, how the consumers decide or the the the, the decision how the how it taken to maximize the utility second thing is from the producer side and what i just added is ultimately that we are talking these decisions are in the short term and only two variables three variables dr swami talked about capital and labor but of course he will be talking about innovation in next ep episode uh, when he talks about the growth but in actual uh, effect these days we say management is also a function machine is also a function and of course innovation is one very important function as they say uh, the the element of entrepreneurship determines the success uh, of a firm and uh, therefore in a multi uh, varied situation uh, this two way two uh, dimensional graph will not satisfy we we'll have to go for multi varied uh, objective functions and these will be linear or non linear using operations research these uh, solutions can be found thank you dr swami that's it no no you pick an end it yeah sorry go ahead well i uh, say so certainly uh, the uh, calculus is key to learning economics and to become an economist my, my idea is right now uh, to make people understand that there is a scientific basis for decision making in economics now when you get into uh, over time oh there are lots of factors for example in finance you can't do it on a static basis because you get 
you take a loan and then that is paid over the time and then the rate of return over time which has to be discounted by the interest rate prevailing so many factors are there so the uh, therefore i i will have to wait till the basic concept uh, is uh, established in the mind and then uh, 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 proceed ahead to all these uh, multivariate uh, complications Thank you, sir. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Swami, uh, uh, for giving such an important to topic and its in coverage and a new dimension for the people to learn, our uh, uh, listeners and viewers uh, who are trying to learn the basics of economics. They are grateful to you uh, for the, the lessons that you have given today. Uh, thank you, uh, Jagdish, and thank you, Ramesh, also, including the technical team. As Jagdish has said in the beginning, Sunday we have a the regular episodes of words of wisdom gyan ganga tomorrow 8 pm indian standard time we will be meeting again with a new topic and dr subramanian swami till till then namaskar jai hind